Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. Before starting the video, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button and give this video a like up. Today on The Young and the Restless, Phyllis tells Lucy about her past, while promising Daniel that she will prove his innocence. Suspecting that Sharon framed him, all products and services featured are independently chosen by editors. However, Soaps.com may receive a commission on orders placed through its retail links, and the retailer may receive certain auditable data for accounting purposes. At the park, Summer joins Phyllis, Lucy, and Daniel. She tells them that Chance said Daniel needs a lawyer and the evidence is pretty gaming. Phyllis urges Daniel to hold it together. She reminds him that he's strong and assures him they're going to get through this. She's his mom and he knows what she's capable of. She never gives up, ever. And neither should you. Daniel thanks her. Lucy sits on the park bench, upset. Summer sits by her and Lucy worries that the police think her dad is guilty. Phyllis says Chance is just trying to give her dad the best advice. Lucy fears her dad will get arrested. Summer reassures her. Daniel thinks Chance should find out who is setting him up and who would want to hurt Heather in the first place. Phyllis steps aside and remembers Sharon ranting at Heather in the club. Phyllis tells her children that this is someone with a clear motive and so clever they could break into the apartment without anyone finding out. She muses, what if it were Sharon? Daniel thinks that's a stretch. Phyllis asks, is it? She was there when she got in Heather's face, and Nick and her kids have been going on and on about her mental instability. It's odd that she showed up at the apartment that Heather died. Instead of telling them, she told the police. She claimed that Heather was afraid of Daniel, and then all of this evidence showed up at his apartment. Daniel says it's not enough to point the finger at her for murder. Phyllis intones, it's enough for me. Daniel thinks she wants to hang it on Sharon because of all the years they spend hating each other. Phyllis denies it. She's one of the only ones who knows what that woman is truly capable of. She flashes to her past clashes with the blonde, including the fight in the chocolate fountain. Phyllis acknowledges her history with Sharon, but says if Daniel doesn't think the blonde capable of violence, he's very wrong. She tried to kill me once. She recalls Sharon putting her in a coma for over a year with the fall down the stairs. And we all know what she did to Cameron Kirsten Wright. Summer says that was self-defense. Phyllis says it means she's capable of it. She theorizes that maybe Heather and Sharon got into a fight and it was a tragic accident. Daniel can't buy her framing him for murder. He doesn't meet his mother going off. Phyllis understands why he'd think she overreact, given the things she's done in her life. Lucy asks, what kind of things? Daniel says her grandmother has taken things to the extreme from time to time. Phyllis sits Lucy down. Would you like to know about your grandmother? I have a few stories to tell you. Summer worries about Lucy hearing the stories. Phyllis will keep it clean. She wonders. Where do I start? She tells Lucy that everything she's done has been to protect people she loves. Let's start with the dead octopus. Daniel groans. Summer's appalled to hear that she put a dead octopus in Paul and Christine's honeymoon bed. Phyllis next tells her granddaughter that she's been known to go undercover. She flashes through some of her disguises. Summer and Daniel marvel that even they haven't heard some of these stories. Phyllis was afraid they'd judge her. Daniel says she's always done her best. They know that. Phyllis tears up. She's made mistakes. Starting with your father, she tells Daniel. It comes out that she stalked him. Phyllis tells Lucy it was complicated. She was determined to make their family work. She explains that almost losing Daniel when he was a baby brought them together. She flashes to Danny proposing. Lucy asks what happened next. Phyllis muses, How do I explain? Daniel says the truth is a good place to start. Phyllis tells Lucy she loved Danny very, very much. But he didn't love her back. She lied and manipulated to keep her family together. And then somebody whose name rhymes with the name Cricket told him Daniel wasn't his biological child. She lost custody of her son. She flashes to a time she tried to see him. Lucy finds this story sad. Phyllis says it was sad for a long, long time. And then we found each other, right? Daniel smiles. They remember when they reconnected. Lucy asks, So you and Grandpa never? Phyllis says no. She tried, but his heart belongs to Christine. She likes to think she's changed and grown, mainly because of her kids. You guys are the reason that I keep going. Daniel urges her to tell Summer's story. Phyllis tells Lucy, She'll have to tell her about Jack first. She wasn't his type. She looks back on her early relationship with the Abbott. 
Phyllis smiles that they had so much fun. She flashes to, flashing him her red lingerie. She tells Lucy she didn't want to commit, but Jack had other ideas. She remembers him proposing and assuring her that she's part of the family. For a while, she was part of the Abbots. Lucy asks what happened. Phyllis tried to give Jack a child, and they found out she couldn't conceive. It was a crushing blow to him. Enter Diane with Kyle. Ultimately, that's what ripped them apart. Phyllis remembers scenes from that painful time. Phyllis tells Lucy, Oh, I loved him. There are just some hurdles you cannot get over. She turns to Summer. Then I connected with your father. She recalls her first kiss with Nick and their early days together. Daniel says that was after the accident with Cassie. Phyllis says she was lost, Nick was grieving, and they found each other. Daniel marvels that so much of their lives can be traced back to that night. Summer says it's weird to think that she might not have been born if not for her dad's grief over Cassie. Phyllis says that's not true. They have a very deep connection. She explains it was complicated with Sharon and Jack, but then, surprise, Summer smiles. I came along. Phyllis didn't know if Jack or Nick was her father. Lucy asks, what did you do? Phyllis says she talked of her best friend and flashes to telling Michael she was pregnant. Summer knows that her dad didn't go back to Sharon. He stayed with you. Phyllis says he did and remembers Nick calling her Mrs. Newman. Lucy asks what happened next. Phyllis says what happened next was beautiful, but also the most terrifying night of her life. She teases that it was a dark, stormy night. She went into labor. Nick went to get the hospital bag, but he had to save Daniel's life after he went off the road. She got stuck in an elevator at Newman Enterprises with Jack. Lucy marvels that Jack had to deliver the baby of the guy she left him for. Phyllis says yes. Phyllis then touches on the tale of Sharon switching Summer's paternity test. Anyway, Nick and I didn't live happily ever after, did we? She sighs that it was such a good ride with him, though. Lucy thinks her granny is awesome. Her dad and Summer are pretty lucky. She's a different kind of mom, but she loves her kids and will do anything for them, like mine. Lucy hugs Phyllis. Daniel thinks they should call it a night. Summer asks her mother what she'll do about Sharon. Phyllis doesn't know yet, but Daniel is innocent, and she will prove it. One thing she's learned in her life is that her internal radar is on point. Secondly, people will do crazy things to get what they want. She'll be careful and will gather information. She'll have to change Chance's mind and asks her kids not to try and stop her. Phyllis takes their hands. We as a family will get through this together. They share a group hug. In the small, sun-soaked town of Willow Creek, where gossip traveled faster than the morning train and secrets nestled in the shadows of white picket fences, Phyllis Harper had always prided herself on her keen intuition. She was the unofficial town historian, chronicling every scandal and heart act in her well-worn notebook, a leather-bound treasure filled with tales that spanned decades. But today, her instinct was ignited by something more sinister than mere gossip. She suspected her longtime friend, Sharon, had framed Daniel for a crime he didn't commit. It all began on a breezy autumn afternoon. Leaves crunched underfoot as Phyllis walked her usual route to the local cafe, the warm scent of cinnamon wafting through the air. As she entered, she noticed a commotion near the counter. The usually serene cafe buzzed with tension as patrons whispered in hushed tones, their eyes darting toward the door. Did you hear about the break-in at the Johnson's place? A woman whispered, her voice trembling. They say Daniel was seen near there that night. Phyllis's heart sank. Daniel, a gentle soul known for his kindness and unwavering support of the community, was facing accusations that could tarnish his reputation. Without hesitating, she approached Sharon, who was standing by the window, her expression unreadable. Sharon, have you heard about Daniel? Phyllis asked, concern lacing her voice. Yes, it's terrible. They're saying he was involved in the break-in, Sharon replied her tone feigning shock. Phyllis noticed the slight twitch in her friend's lips, a telltale sign of her discomfort. Do you really think he did it? Phyllis pressed, studying Sharon's face for any hint of truth. Sharon shrugged, her eyes glinting like shards of glass. I don't know what to think. He has a history, doesn't he? Remember when he lost his job? That was the moment Phyllis's instincts kicked into overdrive. Daniel had indeed faced hardship, but he had worked hard to overcome it. It was a low blow for Sharon to bring it up, especially in a moment of crisis. Phyllis's mind raced. Could Sharon, who had always been fiercely protective of her own interests, have orchestrated this entire debacle? 
Determined to find out the truth, Phyllis decided to investigate. She strolled to the Johnson's house, a charming, if slightly worn, home at the end of Maple Street. The police tape flapped in the wind, a stark reminder of the crime that had taken place. A few neighbors stood nearby, gossiping animatedly. Phyllis, did you hear? Daniel was caught at the scene. Mrs. Ellis exclaimed, shaking her head. Phyllis smiled politely, her mind racing as she scanned the area. As she approached the front porch, she spotted a small object glinting in the grass. A silver bracelet. It was familiar. She knelt down to pick it up, her heart racing. It belonged to Sharon. Later that evening, Phyllis invited Daniel over for coffee. As they sat on her porch, the sunset painting the sky in hues of orange and pink, she could see the worry etched on his face. Phyllis, I didn't do it. I swear, he pleaded, running a hand through his unruly hair. I believe you, Daniel, but we need to figure out who did this, she replied, holding the bracelet tightly in her palm. What can you tell me about Sharon? Daniel frowned. Sharon? She's been a good friend to me. But, I don't know. There's been something off lately. She seems distant. Phyllis's mind raced. What if Sharon had set him up, using their friendship as a shield while orchestrating this crime? Over the next few days, Phyllis began to dig deeper. She visited the cafe daily, gathering snippets of conversation and observing Sharon's behavior. Each time, Sharon's reactions felt rehearsed, too perfect, as if she were playing a part. Phyllis knew she had to confront Sharon directly, but she needed more proof. One evening, Phyllis decided to pay Sharon a surprise visit. She arrived just as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across the yard. The front door swung open, revealing Sharon with a forced smile. Phyllis, what a lovely surprise, she said, though the edge in her voice was palpable. Just thought I'd drop by, see how you were holding up with everything that's been going on. Phyllis replied, stepping inside. The living room was impeccably tidy, but a strange odor lingered in the air something metallic. As they settled down with tea, Phyllis casually mentioned the bracelet. I found something interesting at the Johnson's place. She began, watching Sharon's face closely. A silver bracelet. You wouldn't happen to know anything about it, would you? Sharon's smile faltered for just a moment, but she quickly recovered. No, can't say I've seen it. Why? What's so special about a bracelet? Phyllis leaned in, her voice steady. It belongs to you, doesn't it? I recognize the engraving, and I have to ask, why would it be at the scene of a crime where Daniel was accused? Sharon's demeanor shifted, her eyes narrowing. Phyllis, you're being ridiculous. You're not seriously suggesting I had anything to do with this. Why not? You've had motives, haven't you? You've always been envious of Daniel's ability to connect with people, to gain their trust. Phyllis accused, her voice firm. The tension in the room crackled like a storm brewing. Sharon's expression hardened, and Phyllis felt a flicker of fear, but pressed on. I think you set him up. You wanted to push him out of the way. I would never. Sharon spat, her voice rising. But the anger in her eyes was shadowed by a flicker of something else. Panic. In that moment, Phyllis realized she had struck a nerve. The carefully constructed facade was crumbling, revealing the jealousy that had festered beneath their friendship. I'll find out the truth, Sharon. You can't hide forever. Phyllis warned, standing up to leave. As she walked out, her heart raced. She needed to take this to the authorities. With a heavy heart, Phyllis knew she was standing at the edge of a much darker truth than she had anticipated. Willow Creek had its share of secrets, but none so dangerous as the betrayal lurking beneath the surface of a long-standing friendship. As she made her way home, the cool night air filled her lungs, fueling her determination. She wouldn't let Daniel take the fall for a crime he didn't commit especially not for someone she had once called a friend.